Good evening, or good morning, everybody. Sorry, it's so dark in here. All right. Hey, uh, it's a privilege to be here today. Um, I'm so excited to get to talk to you guys again and bring what I believe is a word from the Lord. Um, I just like to always quickly point out, like, Wits in the, the he's, in, he's here today, so he's probably pretty nervous. He's like, man, what's Hadley going to say? I hope this lands well. Uh, don't be nervous, buddy. I got you. Um, we want to give him a day off because he does such good hard work for us, and he just puts messages together week over week, and his family just serves and serves. And so uh, on top of that, they do the day-to-day business, and it's a lot of work. So I'm excited to be here today. Um, the, the, the people that serve out in the lobby, behind us here in the stage, um, the staff, we are so lucky to have this church, folks, and God is moving here, and I'm just so excited to be a part of it. Um, I'm an elder here at the church. My name's Hadley, and uh, I would have to just say I couldn't do anything without my lovely wife, Melissa, and my, my family, my kids, my four kids. So I've been told that I'm a funny guy. Um, we'll see about that, right? Um, so I can be quick-witted, sharp tongue. That can be a bad thing at times. And I thought, you know, let's crack the ice today. Let's go for it. I'm going to say a joke, all right? I'm not a joke kind of guy, so I need you to give me grace. I need you to clap even if it's not funny, okay? Let's break the ice today together, all right? You ready for this? All right, this is a, a, a joke I heard. I thought it was pretty funny. There was a man, a wife, and his mother-in-law, and they decided to visit the Holy Land. And while they were there touring the Holy Land, sadly, the mother-in-law passed away. And while the man was visiting with the undertaker, he said, look, sir, we can ship your mom back to the United States for 5,000, or mother-in-law back for $5,000, or we can bury her here for $150. And the man turns to him and says, "Uh, well, let's go ahead and prepare her body and send her back to the United States. And the undertaker says, wow, I... I'm just curious, why would you do that? It's, it's so much more affordable to do that here, and she would be here in the Blessed Holy Land. And the man looked at him, the undertaker, and said, Sir, um, 2,000 years ago, a man was buried here and rose again, and I can't take that chance. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, thank you. All right, ice broken? Yeah, I thought that was funny. I'm glad that landed. I was like, oh, this could be bad. Uh, mother-in-laws, we love you. Um, I love my mother-in-law. She's still living. And I would bury her a thousand times in Israel if I thought that she would come back. Um, But uh, anyways, um, I want to step into this sermon today and just kind of start out with what the big point is, because I think it's important for us to take something big away from every message we hear. It's hard to to download the entire sermon and walk throughout the rest of the week. But but the the title of this sermon today is Finding Your Fire. We've got to find our fire. And, and, and I want to walk through what that means for us as Christians and how do we find that fire. And, and so the big point is, is we want you to walk out your faith. We want you to, to, to step out here today and go shine the light for Jesus around town and around this world. So that's the big picture takeaway that we're going to discuss today. Um, we're going to be reading out of the Action Bible. So if you're not familiar with the Action Bible, they'll put it up on the screen there. It's a comic book Bible. So this is geared for men and young boys. Um, Just kidding. Uh, It's for young adults. It's for people that like comics, but it's something unique we've never done before. I read this to my children almost every night, and we've went through this eight times now. It's it's thousand pages long or so. It's a beautiful illustration for you, and if you want to pour the word of Jesus into your kid's heart, I'd buy this. Um, I'd, I'd read this through and through. It's exciting, and even for new believers like myself who, who learn with pictures. Uh, it's, it's helped me grow my faith. And so we're going to do something a little unique. In the background of Daniel 3 is this is the story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Who has heard of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Right? If you grew up in church, you probably heard the story. It's a pretty cool story. Um, but to, before we dive into that story, here's what you need to know. Israel is living in the promised land, and, and, and God is telling them, you guys keep worshiping idols and you 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 just have bad leadership and you need to repent and they're just not doing it and they're going back and forth back and forth and god's warning i'm going to haul you out of the promised land i'm going to take this away from you and finally his grace is over and he has the babylonian empire swoop down and take the best and brightest they kill a lot of people and they live the poor leave the poor peasants uh, there to work the land and so where we pick up in daniel 3 is that 
we are going to follow um, three men who are the best and brightest from Israel's culture that are now being pushed into the Babylonian Empire, and they're expected to assimilate and then produce for the king. And, and, and so we're going to pick up in the Action Bible, and this story is called Facing the Heat. I'm going to use my voices here, so this is what my kids get, kind of, so you know, bear with me. Thanks to Daniel's miraculous interpretation of the king's dream, Nebuchadnezzar promotes him and his three friends to high positions uh, of government. Three uh, years pass, and the four Hebrew men rule wisely and well, but the news does not make the king's other advisors very happy. Why should foreigners get power and honor instead of us? We have to get rid of Daniel. Not now, he's too powerful, but if we can turn the king against Daniel's friends, we might be able to cause trouble for Daniel. Their opportunity comes when Nebuchadnezzar conquers Jerusalem. The king decides he's greater than all the gods and builds a statue of himself. All of his officials must, wor must worship it or be thrown into the fiery furnace. The king is playing right into our hands. He doesn't know that the Hebrews will only worship their god. Daniel holds too high of a position for any one of us to report him, but not his friends. Right. Tomorrow, when the trumpet sounds and all the people bow before the statue, we'll keep our eyes on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. At King Nebuchadnezzar's command, the giant statue 90 feet high has been built on the plains of Dura. All the officials of Babylon are ordered to worship it. The hour of worship comes and the moment the king's jealous advisors have been waiting for. The musicians are taking their place. The signal will come soon, the one that means death to Daniel's friends. Music fills the air. The officials of Babylon bow down and worship the golden statue, all but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. See, they refuse to bow down. Eagerly, the jealous advisors report to the king. O oh, king, three of your Hebrew officials have defied you. They refuse to worship your statue. What? Bring them to me at once. Worship the statue or I'll throw you into the fiery furnace. Tell me what God can save you from that. The God we serve can save us from anything, including fire. But even if he doesn't, we will never worship an idol. Heat the furnace seven times hotter than before and throw them in. The three Hebrews are quickly bound and thrown into the raging fire. Ah, it's too hot. I'm burning. And if you note here, that's not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That is the men that have been charged with throwing them in the fire. They're burning up. But when the king looks into the furnace, they're alive. The flames haven't even touched them. Didn't we throw three men into the fire? We did, O king. But I see four, and the fourth looks like someone from heaven. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out. Nebuchadnezzar is struck with awe and wonder. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent the angel, his angel to save them. From now on, anyone who dares to say a word against their God will die. All right, that's the end of that story. And I, I want to just kind of point out a couple things. Um, first of all, the angel in the fire is Jesus. And, and Jesus wasn't born yet, but Jesus shows up all throughout the Old Testament, which is amazing. And the way we know that is because the Bible uses a special word, uh, and, and we see it as a capital A angel, not a lowercase angel. So we know that Jesus uh, was in the fire with them. And number two, this is another uh, account of how God saves his people uh, time and time again. Here they are in captivity, yet the king has such a powerful movement of God that he says, if anybody goes against my, these people, their God, they're in trouble. So here they are in captivity. They get to worship their God freely. This happens time and time again throughout the Old Testament, how God swoops down and ensures that his people's, the remnants, will continue on uh, throughout history because we're all on God's timing, not our own. And so I want to break down the four steps or the four paths or the four, four things that we can see within this scripture. I think it's very important because if we want to find our fire, we got to understand how to follow this. The first um, step I would say is forget what the world calls you. The world is constantly trying to define who we are. And, and, and the, the truth of the matter is, is we care. I cared from a very young age what people thought about me, how, how I looked 
compared to them. And if we're really honest, we care all the way through our entire lives. But did you know that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that wasn't really their real names? So to get that, we've got to back up to Daniel 1, 6-7. Four young men from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, were among those selected. The head of the palace staff gave them Babylonian names. Daniel was named Belteshar, Hananiah was named Shadrach, Mishael was named Meshach, and Azariah was named Abednego. So I, I had Andrew help me put this illustration together that he'll put up on the screen for us. And um, this helps us kind of understand, this is what the Hebrew name meant, and here's what Babylon, Babylonians define them as. First of all, you've got Daniel, means God is my judge. And they changed his name to Belteshazzar, which means Bel protects his life. Bel was a god in their belief system. Hananiah, the Lord is gracious, changed to Shadrach, command of Aku. And you can see how their names mean one thing in, in Hebrew, and then they complement it in the Babylonian. That's what the devil does. The devil takes some truth and then he spins it in a way that, that we can, it's believable enough, but it's a complete lie. Michel means who is like God. And Meshach means who is what? Aku, which means, uh, you know, he's saying, this, this Michel, he is like God. He acts like God. He talks like God. He, he, he's not God, but he has every, all the essence of God in it. And they're saying, no, 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 he's like the moon God. Um, Azariah, the Lord helps him. And changed to Abednego, the servant of Negu, the, the god of wisdom. Um, why did the kingdom of Babylon, why did the king want this to happen? Well, they wanted to assimilate these people into uh, their culture, and so they want them to put down their god. They want them to put down their belief systems, their traditions, and to pick up theirs. And, and that's how they saw that they could become Israelites that were essentially Babylonians. And I've broken uh, down four subsets of life, 0 to 20, 20 to 40, uh, 40 to 60, and 60 and up. And I want to look at, in these different age groups, what do we have in this time frame that God gives us? And, and what is, what's the challenges we're dealing with? And what pressures do the world put on us? And, and the very most important part is this youth age that I want to talk about, the, the youth, the age is 0 to 20. Um, this could even include people that are still in college. This time of life, you are just desperately trying to find what your identity is. And, and so there's a period of great learning. You're in school uh, this entire time. Um, your body is changing constantly. Your brain is developing. And the world is moving in a unique way in this generation currently than it ever has. We have so smartphones. We have social media. We have YouTube. We have the internet at large. And I, I would just like to pause and say, parents, um, are we watching our kids' social medias? Are we, are we restricting what content they're having, what they're sending uh, their friends, and what they're saying, and, and what they're absorbing into their minds at this young age? Are we having an influence in there? And that doesn't really discount the kids. Kids, 0 to 20, young adults, are you restricting yourself? Are you looking at the content and, and saying, well, maybe that's not for me, and maybe I need to help my friends move away from this or that? Um, it's up to us as parents and you as young adults to establish what is going to be the baseline for my life. And during this time frame, you're stretching your boundaries, and you're determining what is, what, who am I? Who am I outside of my parents? What do I believe? And what the devil wants to do is he wants to sow confusion into this generation. It, it, the plan's been the same all along. The devil's not that creative. He's been doing this a long time, and that's why he seems a lot smarter than us, because he's been around. But he's just trying to confuse this generation, because if he can get them off-center or away from God, then he doesn't have to follow and track them the rest of their whole life. And so we need to be aware of how the world is putting pressure on the youth. The next generation would be the early adulthood, um, the ages zero, or 20 to 40. In this age group, you are achieving great increase. And, and how is that? Well, now you, you've got your big uh, boy or girl job, and you're moving up the ladder. And, and, and the world's telling you, are you really uh, going to be successful compared to your peers? Or did you get the best degree you could have gotten? 
Um, you're getting married, and, and the world's putting pressure on you, uh, saying, look, here's the world goals you want. How does your wife compare to that? Instead of flipping that thought process and thinking, this is the person that I need to do life with. How can I compromise? Um, the world uh, is saying, buy a house. And you're going, well, do, do, how do I compare with everybody else? Am I keeping up with the Joneses? And you're having children, and the world would tell you, hey, you know what you should do first? You should, you should get your finances in order. Because, boy, you, you don't want to have your finances out of order and have children. And, and you know what? You should probably have 1.2 kids because, you know, you can have three dogs and 1.2 kids, and, and that will be a way more comp less complicated life, and you'll be vacationing more. The world's putting pressure on us, and instead we should be going, God, what do you want for our lives? The next age group is that middle adulthood range, and that's that 40 to 60. And this is when you have the greatest impact in life. Okay, because you've been in the marketplace, you've been learning the ways of the world, and so you're able to have a, a, a huge impact. And, and, and at this point in your life, you've got adult children. And, and, and you're wondering, are they ever going to get out of my basement? Um, <laughs> and, uh, but, but you're moving up at, at work, and, and this whole life the world's been telling you, get to the top, get to the top, and you get to the top, and you're so stressed out, you can't hardly manage anything. Uh, or or your, your nest is becoming empty, and, and the world's saying, do you really even know your spouse anymore? Is there, is there anything there to salvage? Maybe you should look somewhere else. And, and then you're dreaming about retirement as if it's right here. Even though the, the world would have you do that, you're not thinking about how blessed you are to have today. The last group is, is, is the late adulthood group, which would be the senior group, and the age is 60 plus. These people have their peak influence. And the, real, the big point that I want to hammer down on, great, you have, great, you have grandchildren, you have grand, great-grandchildren. The joke is you get to fill them full of sugar and send them home to their kids and watch them scramble. But the reality is, is that culture in the world is saying, your time's up. Get in the pastor. We don't want to hear what you have to say anymore. You screwed up things to begin with. Get out of here. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. We have to realize that you guys have peak influence in our culture. You need to get in our church and start serving in the nursery. You need to get on a small group and start teaching people what you know, because maybe things have evolved, but if you don't pass down what you know, if you don't run your race to the finish line, I, I, I would just think God might be going, hey, wait, we, we had 20 more years of action out of you, and you just kind of sat back and, and went self-absorbed, and, and we wanted you to pour out that influence that you had. Um, the Bible backs this up in 1 Samuel 16, 7. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Another verse is Psalms 139, 14. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full and well. Thank God that he looks inward and not outward like we do. We need to start looking at the things of this life like Jesus and God would have pointed us out to do. And so when we know what the world is trying to put influence on us and what the pressure of the world is, the second part is that we've got to pick our path. Are we going to choose the path of God or are we going to choose the path of self or the world? We have to pick a path. And in Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had to choose as well. The difference was they were in captivity. We would say, well, we're not in captivity, right? Like, I, I can't, can't relate to that. But I, I don't know. I, I've been addicted to something before. And, and I've had thoughts that held me from being able to move to that next level of thinking. So maybe we are in captivity. Second Peter 3, 9 would say, lucky for us, God is patient and gives us time to find him. Thank the Lord that his patience isn't ours because the, the world would have lasted seven days. And he would have been like, nah, we're done. The Lord is patient for us to find his promises, but we shouldn't put this off. We should realize that we're here today for a purpose and that he has a, a calling on our lives. And I want to break down uh, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego so that you can see how they chose their path. Um, so we need to back up to Daniel 1, 4 where it says, select only strong, healthy, and good-looking men. So we know these guys were good-looking guys. Uh, make sure that they are well-versed in every branch of learning, so they're smart, and gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. 
from all intents and purposes, these guys have what we want, right? We want those things. Um, but they had to choose obedience to their God or disobedience, which meant, you know, against their God. And, and they were immediately tested. Again, looking at Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. But Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were determined not to defile themselves by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. Why would they not take the food and wine given to them by the king? This was the best food and wine in the whole kingdom, and they denied it. Why? Because the food was uh, given and sacrificed to their gods. They would, they would give the meat to their god and, and pray over it, and they'd give the wine and pray over it. And these guys were saying, no, look, we're not going to defile ourselves. We're not going to trade good food uh, today for an empty promise that, that, that you're giving us with being healthy and fit. Um, and, and so they went to the advisors and said, guys, um, we're going to take a risk here, but we don't want to do that. And, and the advisors are like, look, guys, uh, if you're a vegetarian, um, you're not going to look so hot in a few days. And that's going to look bad on us, so we're going to need you to eat the meat and wine. They said, give us 10 days. And what happened? After 10 days, it says they were healthier and better nu- nourished. So they were allowed to pr- proceed. So there you go. All you vegetarians, just knock the person next to you and say, see, I told you so. The point is, is they pick their path. And in that path, it could have meant death for them. But they decided at that moment. See, these guys, they didn't come to Babylon with some fickle faith. They had already been studying God's word. And it was in, it was in them to be able to stand up and say, this is what I believe and, I'll, and I'm willing to die for it. There was no guarantee, but they acted in faith, and in return, they received the blessing of obedience. Let's look at what Daniel 1.17 says. God gave these four men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. These guys were given something supernatural. Did you see that? An unusual aptitude. They, they, they didn't have these things naturally. God poured it into them through their obedience. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meaning of visions and dreams. Who wouldn't want to be able to do this stuff, right? Who, who doesn't want this in their life, but yet all the time we just go, eh, you know, I'll, I'll, take, the, the, I'll take the fast food burger. I, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to take the harder route and, and prepare my meal for myself. So, you know, we do this all the time. And my path growing up was I was in the church. I was raised in the church. I was baptized at 11. I believed in God. I I asked him to be in my heart. Um, But my faith went in and out, in and out. And I have to say, unfortunately, at at the age of 43, more of my life was pointed in the direction of the world. And and when when I hopefully die at at an old age, I'd like to be able to say that more of my life was serving God um, because I'm not going to turn back at this point. But the fact is, is I spent most of my life serving the world. And... um, there were three things that turned me around. Uh, number one, when you ask Jesus into your heart, the Holy Spirit is constantly on you saying, hey, hey, come back. It, you know, it will eventually be too late, Hadley. And, and so I wanted that communion with Jesus. I wanted him in my heart to be speaking to me and guiding my steps. So that was one reason that drew me back. The second thing is, is I knew my kids were going to wear my sins. And I'm not perfect. I have sins and they're going to wear them, and that's going to be part of it. But there were things that I was doing that I just didn't want them to pick up. And so you have to ask yourself as parents, there's no bad time to stop and, and show your kids, okay, look, I screwed up. I don't want you to do the same thing I did. And, and the third thing is, is I sold my wife that I was a Christian. When we met at Lincoln Christian College, she's like, this guy's in for Jesus. And then I'm like, gotcha, not really. Um, and I followed myself for a while there. And, and, and I felt that calling to, to live up to that promise that I'd given her and say, look, I'm, I'm going to serve Jesus. I'm going to come alongside of you, and I'm going to lead our household as, as a man and a wife. I had to choose obedience over disobedience. And what did that take? Discipline. It takes discipline. I fall. I get back up. I fall. I get back up. You have to be committed to the path of following Jesus. And what does your path look like? Maybe it looks a lot like mine. Um, but if you choose to point away from Jesus, you will get the intended result. I'll just tell you that. If you point away from Jesus, you'll get the intended result. What is that? Well, let's say, and these are all things that I've struggled with, okay? I'm not putting things down here to just persecute you or I, I'm, this is me, uh, addiction. 
If you choose addiction, you're choosing trouble. Maybe you lose friendships. Maybe you lose your spouse. Maybe you lose your kids. Maybe you go to jail. Maybe you have some sort of health issue. When you choose unfaithfulness, you're choosing loneliness. When you can't commit to a friendship or to your spouse, then people won't want to spend time with you. They, they, need, they need commitment out of you. If you choose gossip, you're choosing drama in your life. If you choose yourself, you're choosing your priorities over others and God. If you choose unforgiveness, then you can't receive the forgiveness that God is offering us. And, and, and I'll say this last thing. Young people, people that are single, um, if you're dating a non-Christian and you're a believer in Jesus, you're in hot water. I'll tell you that right now. Um, you're choosing a path, a spiritual battle. And, and there's some kids that can say, I, I know what that feels like. I'm in a household right now where, where I see that. And, and honestly, it's mostly the guys. We're not stepping up. I didn't step up for probably the first 15 years of our marriage and lead our household. So I know. I, I'm not sitting from a, a place of high my high horse and judging, I'm saying it's, it's a commitment to family and we as men need to lead and we need to realize as young adults that if we pick somebody that is spiritually misaligned with us, that we will have spiritual battle our entire lives. We will not be uh, connected on how we should raise our, raise our kids spiritually or even in this world in many ways because they just don't line up. So we have to point towards Jesus and um, I would say this, here's the guarantee. John 16, 33, in this world you will have trouble. And some of you are like, man, Hadley, uh, I came here to be uplifted today. Uh, hold on a second, I got you. Pointing towards Jesus will give you uh, God's truths and promises. Pointing towards Jesus will give you peace that passes understanding. Pointing towards Jesus will heal your wounds physically, mentally, spiritually. You may still have the scars, but those are meant to go testify to the word of Jesus and how he saved you and changed your life. Pointing towards Jesus gives you strength to overcome spiritual battles. Pointing towards Jesus pours out your wisdom in your life, and who doesn't want supernatural wisdom in your life? Pointing towards Jesus allows you to see his perfect plans for you, maybe in hindsight or maybe step by step, but it gives you that insight and that's the wonderful thing about pointing towards Jesus. Luke 9, 23, 25 says this, Then he said to the crowd, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but yourself are lost or destroyed? I think we've got to wake up to the fact that the Scripture is telling us that if we follow the world, the intended result is we go to hell. Or if we follow Jesus, the intended result is we will have trouble, but our life will be blessed with obedience, and we will see God's peace and calling on our lives. So we need to pick a path. The third thing that we see in this story is that you've got to walk out your faith. Or like I say, you've got to get to stepping. It's time to get to stepping, folks. We have to accept Jesus in our heart, and then we have to get to walking, at, walking out our faith. And, and, and I'm going to give you some works things. The, these, are, these are things that are, are, we'll go through this, but let me just start out with this. Reading the Bible. We, we hammer down on this all the time, and I hope I can give you a kind of a unique perspective to this, but I, I need to say it first. There's 900 translations in America to choose from. What's our excuse? There's thousands of commentaries of people that have said, well, this is what this means in the Old Testament. I just don't like the Old Testament. That's just too hard to understand. Uh, there's a Bible uh, app that will read to you uh, and give you plans. So we don't really have an excuse. We need to ask Jesus to come into our heart and give us a fire for it because the, the, the Word, God's Bible, is how He speaks to us. It's how he, op it's how he enlightens each step for us. So if we're not in God's Word, it's like putting blinders on your eyes. You can't see where He wants you to go. And this scripture in Hebrews 4.12, I love this, for the Word of God is alive and active. That, that, that should mean something to you. That's where He speaks to us. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit. What does that mean? Our soul wants to go this way. It's that part of us that's like drawn to the world. Our spirit is what gets saved through Jesus. 
And, and, and it pierces that and it divides those two. And, and, and it trains the soul to start seeing the things of Jesus because our soul is made up of our mind, right? And our emotions. And it's telling us, this is what I think. This is what I feel. And the Spirit's going, hey, wait, I'm connected to God. And here's what the Word of God is telling us, and it brings those two things into alignment. The second part of that scripture says this, it also penetrates joints and marrow. Ooh, that's kind of gross. It's like a, ugh, okay. Well, what that means is God can actually heal us with the Bible, and I'll prove it to you. Psalms 107.20, he sent out his word, not spoken word, the word of God. He sent out his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. The word of God, if you give it your all, if you put your faith in it, it can heal your body. It can heal your emotions. It can heal your spirit. That is a promise. You know, the second part I'd like to say is we got to learn to pray. Um, Can you have intimacy with your spouse or your girlfriend or your best friend if you don't talk to them? If you're not in communion with them every day? The answer is no, you can't. What does pre- what praying teach us to do? It teaches us to hear God speak to us, and it teaches us to speak to God. And so I would say this, if, if you're struggling with your prayer life, the f- one thing that you'd want to do and not miss is praise God. God is not a genie in a bottle. We're not rubbing the bottle and he comes out and you say, hey, here's what I want today, God. He, he's a personal person God that wants us to speak to him and he wants us to ask for things but the first thing we should do to open our spirit up to his spirit is we should say God thank you for today thank you that on March 10th or 11th that we get an extra hour of sunlight Uh, praise God that you forgave my sins when you sent your son to die on the cross thank you that you're carrying me through this treatment or father even if I don't get through this treatment thank you for giving me peace knowing I'm going to spend eternity with you Praise God for these things. That's what we should do first and foremost. But don't stop there. Move into that personal prayer uh, for other people where you say, God, I I just want to see the salvation of other people. I want you to see you work in my job or my business. I want to see you work uh, in in these cancers that are all around us or, or these illnesses. God, would you please help my daughter find the right guy? These are the things that you should be asking God to do in your personal time after you praise him. And the last thing I would say is, how can you be selfish? He wants you to be selfish. At the end of your prayers, you should say, God, now this is what I want. I want you to give me a burning desire for your word of God. I want you to speak to me. I want you to heal my body. I want you to, uh, to give me peace that passes understanding. I want to I see the, the invincible things that are around me. God, please give these things to me. And God wants to answer our prayers, but he needs to hear us speak. Even though he, he already knows our minds and our hearts, it's just like a parent or my wife. She knows exactly what I'm thinking 99% of the time. It's scary, um, but it's true. And I still need to communicate to her what I need and what I want. And God wants to do the same thing. And it's, it's just like we want to give our children everything that they want within a reason. God wants to give it to us, but he wants us to personalize it and, and to ask him for it. The next thing I would say is baptism. When you say, I want Jesus, you don't stop there. You want Jesus in your heart, and then you need to be obedient to what God's word says. And God's word says that we should be baptized. And I'll tell you why we should be baptized. Uh, Number one, it's something Jesus did. So if Jesus does it, I'd say it's a pretty good idea to follow what he does. And, and, And number two, you can miss out on the blessing of obedience. When you don't act in obedience, You can miss out on the blessing of it. I want you to realize that it's so important that we follow scripture and we put down our tradition. Some of us are from other churches and other religions that teach us that we should be sprinkled. And and I'll tell you this, and this this could rub the wrong way, but that's not biblical. The Bible says that we should be immersed in water. The actual word baptismo says immerse in water. And, And so it is very important that we don't decide for our children what they are going to be. Your children have to decide for themselves. You have to decide for yourself who you are. And when you bring in that faith, uh, you know, it's serious business. I'll, I'll, I'll pull it out in Acts 2.38. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins. So we got to repent. we got to say we're not going to do these things anymore. Turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You want the Holy Spirit in your life. 
It is so important that you allow, that's how God speaks to us is, is his spirit to our spirit. And, and, and look, I know it's hard when you're an adult and you're like, look, I, I, I was baptized when I was a kid. I, I get it. I'll get in that tank with you a thousand times over if that's what it takes. I know it's hard as an adult to put it down. It's easy for a child to jump in. For us, we're like, we don't want to go swimming today. Let's go swimming, folks. Let's go into the baptism. It's so important. The next thing is prioritizing our, our church. Um, my kids used to say to me, Dad, are we going to church today? And that was a pretty clear indicator that I was not prioritizing church. Um, another thing is, is if you're covering your Sundays with, with different activities, um, you might not be prioritizing church. And I know, I get the appeal. My kids ask me, can we go do travel sports? And I'm like, what days are the tournaments? Uh, they're on Sundays. Okay, well, no, you're not going to do that because we're going to go to church. And, and we've done travel sports a little bit, and we've missed Sundays, and we try to catch it up in the car. But we want to prioritize church because it is so important that we worship corporately together, that we, we put our hands up in the air and say, Jesus, thank you. It, it builds faith within believers when we corporately pray together with a, with a common faith. It, it is so important for a body of believers to get together. It says this in Hebrews 10, 25, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of this return is drawing near. The last point within this point is I really feel a heart that we need to be in small groups. Um, there's half of this church is in small groups, and that's great. I think that's a great number. But I think, number one, there's leaders in this room that are not leading, that if you would, if you would just hear that calling on your life, that people would follow you into that group, that people need to know what you know scripturally, what you've walked through and, and how not to walk through that. Um, and, and being in a small group allows us um, to, to cover things and be open in a way that we're not able to do in a large corporate gathering. So it's important that we gather uh, in small groups. It says this in Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three gather together, my followers, I am there among them. What a beautiful thing. When there's just a couple of us together in a small group, God is there. And God is everywhere, but he chooses to come down and rest on us when we meet like that. And know this, I've been talking about works, 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 works. And some of you are like, wait, Hadley, I thought this was, we were in the new covenant with Jesus. It's grace, right? It's 100% grace and 0% works. There is nothing we can do. There's no Bible reading that's going to save us, no praying that's going to save us, no church that's going to save us. Uh, to get in the right standing of God, none of those things are, are going to save us. Uh, it's 100% grace. We are called, though, to co-labor with God. God could do it all, but he's asking you to come right alongside of him and take a step and take a step with him. And I'll say this, we are not saved by good works. We are saved for good works. It is the good works that we want to do when we're following Jesus. It's our heart is positioned in a, in a way that we're like, oh, I need to get in God's word today. I need to commune with God through prayer. I got to get to church and be with other believers today. That's the thing that's so important for us to understand. And as we move into my final point here about this story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, eventually they found their big fire moment, right? And I don't think God calls us to one big fire moment necessarily. Our fire moments can be something small, something just standing up today in a crowd and saying, Hey, I give my life to Jesus. Hey, I, I'm, I'm going to repent today. Hey, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find my fire today. And when you do that, other people are encouraged. They're like, hey, I was thinking the same thing, but I wasn't sure if I could step out. And so we're called to find our fire. And you, you do that by saying, I want Jesus. I believe in Jesus, and I want him in my heart. And, and then we must follow him. And if we're not going to follow him, we're not going to be with him. Following Jesus takes faith. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walked in that faith. And you know what? They didn't see Jesus until they got in the fire. In our culture today, I think we're like, you know what, Jesus, if I'm going to follow you, I need you to show yourself. I need you to prove yourself. And then I'll believe. And, and, and Jesus is sometimes just not going to do that for us because a lot of what we do here is faith built it's requiring us to say, God, I'm going to come towards you and, and I'm going to believe. And just like any relationship, we have to 
know Jesus. How do we know Jesus? We spend time with him. It takes reps. I guarantee you I talk to somebody that's been following Jesus for 40 years compared to my 10, uh, and they would be like, know way more than I would. And they would understand way more than I would of his presence in their life. That's okay. That's the benefit of walking with Jesus over time and building that relationship. And so as we close, I want us to think, what are we... What is it going to take to find your fire? What is it going to take? You know, how many times are you going to have to sit here and hear the word of God? And remember, when we stand before Almighty, he's going to say, now, look, you went to church pretty much your whole life. Uh, We will have to testify the fact of the things that we heard, but what we did with that. And and so I want us to find our fire. And, And I think, what does a fire take? It takes logs, right? We got to put wood in that fire for it to burn. And and folks, we are the the logs. Without us, the fire doesn't burn. God wants us and has called us to be the burning logs in the fire to to for people to go, wait, what is that? There's something burning over. I see something. I want that. I want drawn near to it. We are the logs. And, And and some of us are just sitting out at the edge of the fire and we're just like, hey, you know what? It's really warm. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not actually on fire. I'm just, I'm just lukewarm here. God's not calling us to be lukewarm and comfortable. He's calling us to bring other people to Christ. And we do that when we step into the fire. I want to leave us with this, um, this analogy that I was thinking about. When I was a young boy, I was an avid uh, card collector. I know nothing about sports, by the way. This is just what everybody did in the 80s and 90s. And so I was just wanted to impress you with my card collection. And, and I just look at this. It's pretty amazing. Oh, crap. That's uh, just a few empty pages here. But uh, it's not as impressive as I thought. Um, when we get to heaven, God's going to open a book. And he's going to look at our lives. And he's going to be like, son, this is what you did and didn't do. This, this was meant to be full. And here's when you came to church and here's when you got baptized. But, man, you just never really took off. You just, man, what happened, Hadley? And I think God calls us. He wants us. He wants to open that book for us and he wants to say, Man, Hadley, look at you. Look what you did. You just, you just followed me. Everywhere you could, you just, another salvation. You gave to the church. You gave to people in need. You gave to that homeless man, even though he might be doing drugs with it. You just, you just gave, and you don't even realize the impact of your life. But here's what it is. It's amazing. Matthew 7, 21, 23 says this, Not all those who say you are Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. The only people who will enter the kingdom of heaven are those who will do what my Father in heaven wants. On the last day, many people will say to me, Lord, Lord, we spoke for you. And though, you, though you were, we forced out demons and did many miracles, then I'll tell them clearly, get away from me. You who did evil, I never knew you. It is possible, folks, for us to believe in Jesus but never follow him. The demons believed in Jesus. Do you think you're going to be in heaven with them? I don't, I don't think so. Heaven's not going to be this gathering of fun. It's going to be a dark and lonely place given to us because that's what we desired. We desired separation from light, from Jesus. And that's what it's going to be. And I, I would just ask that that we all stand up right now and prepare our hearts for this next song. And I just want us to be really thinking about like, what is it going to take to find our fire? If you guys could just bow your heads real quick and close your eyes. I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but if you want to find your fire, if you found your fire today, if, if you... If you want to give your life to Jesus, if, if you're saying yes to turning around and repenting, would you just raise your hand? With nobody looking, would you just, yes, thank you up front here. Raise your hand, yes, I see you. Look at these logs growing, getting closer to the fire. What an amazing thing, thank you. Yes, yes, 
Keep them coming, folks. It's not too late. If you want to know Jesus, raise your hand. If you want to repent, today is the day. If you want to grow closer to Jesus, if you want your fire to ignite, then step into it. Yeah, thank you. Amazing. We are going to listen to this song, which is amazing. It was written about this uh, verse. And so listen to it. There's another in our fire with us. It's Jesus. And he is boldly and strongly taking us through that fire. And what I would say is, if you feel bold today, then step up to the front with me. Let's step up to the front and let's put our hands in the air and let's praise Jesus through this song. And let's just together say, we're going to be bold. We're going to move outside these walls with our families. We're going to lead. We're going to go to this town and we're going to lead this town. We're going to be bold for Jesus today. Okay? Thank you.